is the Vintage RPG Podcast. Your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs. With your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast, coming at you again from the clubhouse hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and with me, as always, is the founder and publisher of Unwinnable. He said, Hambone, there may not be a lot of mystery left in the world, but I got a series of books on them. Stu Horvath. <laughs> I want to believe. I want to believe too. <laughs> it's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> it's true. I'm good, man. I'm good. I, it's funny, actually. Like you know, I've been enjoying the spring, early summer weather. We're recording this on the first day of summer, and it feels like October outside. I don't know if you've been outside yet. It's so weird. I was wearing my denim jacket earlier. Yeah, we like we actually like set up like a small like you know, like a, a larger kiddie pool in the backyard, and you know. Uh huh. We're like, all right, it's pool season. Let's do this. And every time like we try to like go in the pool, it's like, oh, ha ha, fooled you. It's fall. <laughs> I think that the uh, big smoke thing is <laughs> blocking out the sun and cooling the planet down or something. It might be the case. You know, let's let's uh, piss the people off. Global warming is a thing. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, man, I'm doing good. I actually went to... Uh, <laughs> All plays. It was funny. I went to see uh, Orville Peck last night, the country oh, singer, uh, at the theater at Madison Square Garden. Not realizing that when I went in the big room, the Cure was playing. Oh, jeez. So, let me tell you about the intersection of like people who are into Orville Peck, people who are into the Cure. There's that beautiful like intersection in the center of the Venn diagram, and it was Madison Square Garden. So uh, <laughs> how strange. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, I was like, oh, can I find a way to dip over and peek in to see the cure? But man, security was tighter than <laughs> I was ready or I anticipated uh, at that hour of the evening. So, mm. folks, if you can get the chance, go see Orville Peck live. You will not be disappointed. So speaking about weird, and wonderful things, Stu, we're talking about the mysterious world that we live in. It's true. <laughs> so. For years, I've been playing this game with myself uh, in which uh, I try and figure out why I am the way I am. <laughs> and I kind of try and find like I cast back in my memory, which is pretty good, but not unfallible to kind of find the things that really influenced my interests uh, at an early age. And uh, I know that I, I got into Edward Gorey pretty early, and that definitely set a sort of tone The John Belair's. Uh, young readers horror novels with gory covers are, are part of that and my local library man like the, they had a section that was all about like the unknown uh it was books on monsters and esp and ghosts and ufos the spooky weird stuff the carney branch library unfortunately does not uh have such a section any longer and um in recent years i remember bookstores used to have like a a section that was sort of mysteries of the unknown uh, oh, that yeah. sort of became new age and, you know, spiritual books. Talk about jumping the shark, right? <laughs> Not what I want. Yeah. And I think the older I get, the more I kind of have detected like an absence of this sort of stuff uh, on bookshelves. And I, I just think that's interesting because I am personally am no less interested. I could read, I could read an encyclopedia, a single volume encyclopedia of spooky stuff, a new one every week. And if it covered the same material and just like approached it slightly differently, and it was like the same ghost stories over and over and over again, I'd be happy. You know? <laughs> Like, yeah, man. Like this, this isn't stuff that loses its appeal for me over time. And I, I'm sure I'm not alone. No, definitely not. I mean, if there's a nook and there's a book and I got a nice cup of coffee, I'll read it. <laughs> uh, the library you talk about, is that the one over by the old eyeball house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the uh, the weather vane. It's such a quaint little library. And I had like much higher hopes for it. But now that they don't have any spooky stuff, I guess I won't ever <laughs> walk down I mean, there. It's still a really nice little library. I, I I really like our local library system. It's just that they don't have any books to stick in that section because there aren't a lot. Yeah, it's funny because you're right. Like there is that point. And I, I remember in the, the bookstores in the mall, there was like all those the weird books, the the weird like sci fi weird world type stuff. Mm -hmm. And then New Age started creeping in. And it, yeah. only, it only takes one book. You know, it only Purple takes cover. one weird new age book with a deceptive cover that'll find is, well, we don't know where else to put this. So we're going to put this in here. And then the infestation begins. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think for a lot of people, their origin story is not as much of a straight line as like, you know, planet blows up, get found <laughs> by Midwestern farmers, raised right, and now, you know, I'm here for truth, justice in the American way. You know, people take paths. People go down different things. You know, certain things in your life hit differently at certain times. Like for me, I will tell you, like, because I'm thinking about it as you're saying it. And like, you know, as much as you're like, oh, my memory is pretty good. My memory is boned. Like, <laughs> you know, listen, I, I had a long weekend lasted about two decades. And even now I'm about to roll up on four years sober. Bro, there's still a lot of stuff that just not coming back. You know, uh, in the the wet recesses of my brain where the pudding <laughs> is. But, you know, I, I will tell you, I, if if you looked at me on any day of the week and twice on Sunday and you said, Hambone had its start, I will tell you Scooby-Doo. It was, for mm -hmm. me, from the youngest age, there were, like, three things that stood out in my mind that, like, you know, where it came from, my grandmother taking me down to the local... uh corner store and buying me comic books you know and i can specifically remember the first batman cover that i ever bought the wizard of oz and scooby-doo those are the three things that like when i was a kid that was like the the perfect where hambone came from until he saw star wars like <laughs> and that's and that was it for me you know music was always in my life because i, I grew up on classic rock radio in new york but yeah man the wizard of oz batman scooby-doo yeah, I have a, my first watch was a Scooby Doo watch. I still have it somewhere. It really is the best. Scooby Doo is important, man. It's bad. and even 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 if it is fundamentally frustrating for me as a a latter generation monster kid to have it always be like old man McCormick from the farm, you know, in a monster mask. Scooby Doo is the only property where that like that gets a pass because the monster costumes are always great. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Scooby Doo's uh, totally important. Uh, Harry House movies were also like super important for me, and just generally any kind of monster movies that I could get uh, at the video store. Do you remember the first time you saw like Godzilla? Oh yeah, actually, just put together a, a watch list for Jer. Oh yeah, he watched Jason of the Argonauts not too long ago. Oh yeah, oh that's great, and it was great. He loves skeletons, so like the skeleton scene like knocked his socks off. And I just wanted to kind of instill in him, they are paced differently than, than modern movies. And, and I think that there's sort of like a vocabulary for those older monster movies that you have to learn. And I wanted to kind of just expose him to it. And he picked up on it a little bit faster than I expected. So, yeah, we're going to work on some Godzilla movies next. Oh, that's great. Because I remember when I first saw Clash of the Titans, it was on Channel 5. I mean, you remember when Channel 5, before it was Fox, it was just Channel 5, like oh, out yeah. of New York? Yeah. Yeah. First time I ever saw Clash of the Titans was on network television oh, on like a Saturday afternoon, like, you know, in between like, you know, Shaw Brothers Kung Fu movies and stuff that they were showing at the time and reruns of MASH, which was like always on. I had oh. a Clash of the Titans lunchbox. Yeah, my God, it was so good. Ah. <laughs> so when I went for the first time in a long time, when, when I brought my kid up to the library, I was sort of like, I knew it was going to happen. I knew that all the books that I loved as a kid weren't going to be there. But they weren't there. And I was kind of crushed on a certain level because, like, you know, they were important. In years previous, I had found a couple of them. Natural History of Unnatural Things by Daniel Cohen is, is a super important one. The Golden Book of the Mysterious, which is full of color paintings by Alan Lee, uh, is another fantastic one. There's all sorts of other ones. I have a whole bunch of uh, books on ghosts, werewolves. Like, I'm, I'm slowly, like, piecing together a collection of all these, like, these corny kids monster books. The Crestwood House uh, monster, uh, you know, the orange, black, and white monster movie books. Another, like, super important thing. And, of course, there's a longer tradition of this. I would say that there might be earlier stuff, like, Lewis Spence did a, a, an encyclopedia of the occult that sort of uh, in the twenties that, that sort of fits the bill. Um, but in terms of a really big, ambitious, full color, sort of exciting, dramatic, mysterious presentation, I think is the uh, Richard Cavendish's man, myth and magic series, which came out in the, uh, I guess there was a, there was a magazine first and then they were collected in a series of hardcover books starting in like 1970. Maybe the magazine started in the 70s and, and the, the books came a little bit later. I don't have a lot of those because they're just before my time and they're a little hard to find, but they're cool. They very much strike the vibe of the uh, Time Life series, which I'm sure is is a real touchstone for a lot of the people who listen to our show. 
the mysteries of the unknown series, that black and silver time life series that had the oh, ghost book and the, yeah. the UFO book and a whole bunch of books on, on mental powers and, and new age stuff. And so it's like a 33 set book mysteries of the unknown. And it started uh, in 1987 and it wrapped up in 1991. So like this th- for me, those black and silver books are the X files before the X files. And then like a couple years later, in 93 when X files came on TV, I was just like, oh, but I have these books, <laughs> you know, like I have, like, like it was just it, like I like, like it manifested itself onto television. Even though half of those books, that series isn't nearly as good as the Enchanted World series from the eighties, which is uh, spookier and more storybook ish. And they're full of like silly stuff, but like it's just such a compelling case. Like it just make I I I have probably half the series downstairs. And like the doofy stuff is just as entertaining as like the really good. The ghost book is so good. Uh, so is the the cryptid book. But for me personally, the most important mystery of the unknown occult monster books were these three Usborne books that I got on a trip to Toronto uh, from the science center there. They're called World of the Unknown, all about UFOs, all about ghosts and all about monsters. They're kid geared. They're fully full color illustrations. They take their subject matter seriously while also like leaving room for silliness. The ghost book covers Jeff, the talking mongoose, which at that point I thought was a a silly story. Uh, Having read more about it, it's it's pretty sad, actually. But they're full of these great illustrations. I don't know who the painter is but has a really distinct style. And there was an earlier series called World of the Supernatural or Supernatural World, which is before my time. I've never had those. And there's some other mythology books that came later that are all equally great. Art and editorial direction is David Jeffries, but I don't think that... Okay, there's there's multiple illustrators. The house style is pretty strong. It looks very similar throughout. They're great. They're like little factoid books. I learned about ghost hunting. I had a form as a kid to fill out if I saw a UFO. Uh, and like like the relevant information, dude, the covers fell off my original copies. Like there was highlighting by the time I replaced them. I think every word was highlighted in the book. So like, like making it like impossible to read. They're just so good. And there's literally nothing on the market like it until, yeah. until like last year. Oh yeah. This is, this is the exciting part. I buried the lead and I have found books that are being produced today that are on the level of us born spooky books tell me more tell me more they are by a gentleman named adam all such boardman that's a name yeah they are uh he's a comic artist or comic illustrator that has a very kind of like um i think of his style as uh i immediately think of finding books because i have i have Ooh, a kid who okay. likes finding books yeah so like like that where's Waldo kind of thing. There's a there's a whole lot of those, and it's sort of like a very simple style that carries a lot of personality. You could probably also maybe compare him to Chris Ware and that like that that really graphic kind of indie comic style. Super clean, like very minimal, but like a really great design sense. Like one is called an illustrated history of ghosts. There's an illustrated history of UFOs. I really, 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 really hope, Adam, if you're listening, take this from my heart. Please make an illustrated history of monsters so that we can have a trilogy. They're fantastic. They're absolutely two of the best books that I have bought in years. They have scratched such a profound itch. They are so good. It is the same basic vibe as Worlds of the Unknown from Usborn, where it's just like it's information it doesn't take a side. You know, he basically is very much uh, aware of cranks within the, you know, the ghost hunting and UFO ufology communities and also kind of calls out some issues. He highlights that almost all ghost hunters and ufologists are white folks, which I think is really funny. I mean, now that you mention it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, like, of course, we're the only people who have time for this nonsense. They're great. Coupled with his way of distilling down stuff that is so wonderfully evocative while being so simple. The inside end papers for the history of UFOs in the front of the book is like a, a visual guide of a whole bunch of different UFO types. And then on the inside, it's a whole bunch of aliens. It's so good, Hamba. I, like, I cannot awesome. stress. They are like 20 bucks. 
you can get them from bookshop.org. Uh, they are fantastic. They re sparked that interest in me. Like I got the same feeling I had as a kid reading these books of the unknown. And I, I just, I hope that, uh, Mr. Boardman has great success with the series. And I hope that he finds suddenly that there's a lot of competition out there because I want so many board books like this. You could do it over and over and over again with a different artist. And it's always going to appeal to me personally. That's awesome. And also look at that. We actually recommended something that will not go up in price on the aftermarket because it's <laughs> new. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to I want to loop back to the Time Life books real quick because sure. you know, for those who may not be familiar with those Time Life books, they had a lot of stuff going on, more than just <laughs> Mysteries of the Unknown. Like I got oh, I yeah. went to Goodreads real quick. So you have like Mysteries of the Unknown. What life was like in different generations. Life Library of Photography, The Third Reich, The Fabulous Century, Voices of the Civil War. The Good Cook, Techniques and Recipes, Voyage to the Universe, American Indians, Understanding Computers, like all over the friggin' place. Oh, home, yeah. Home Repair and Improvement. Yeah, the Home imp the home Improvement one is like hilarious. The The Old West one has these great like tooled leather style covers that like live in my brain as like the 70s in a book. I don't know why. It oh, was, yeah. Like, like, like Kenny Rogers and the Time Life West books were like like the late seventies, early eighties. <laughs> oh, gambler! <laughs> I love that song. Yeah. Oh man. But yeah, I mean this this is like the kind of cool stuff that like you know again I I never want to be like old guy shouting at cloud, but you know there is a beauty to there still being some kind of mystery in the world that most people nowadays just in general, you know, no matter what age or generation you're from, you know, the, the curtains pulled back. You see what the great Oz is doing. He's on TikTok and he's like showing you like all these things you always wondered about, but now like it's, it's all right there. Like there's no, there's no kind of guesswork to it anymore. There's no like fantasy booking in your head over what something is anymore because you can easily access anything on the internet. So the problem, I think actually is, the internet definitely killed these books as, as a form because it was an, an encyclopedic form. So, so publishers felt that I, and I'm, I mean, I'm guessing here, but my theory is that the publishers just saw this as like, well, now that Wikipedia exists, this kind of book isn't important anymore. Like we don't need to publish these as if they were, they were doing it as like a, like an educational service um, and missing the point that they're entertainment, they're just pure and like uh, the best entertainment. Also, I think that the internet um, has allowed a lot of this supernatural stuff to metastasize in weird and unpleasant ways uh, so rapidly that it's hard to to kind of keep up. You look at conspiracy theories, which is something that is a close cousin of ufology. In the 90s, we all felt, you know, thanks to the X-Files and stuff, that, that there was, there was a, an entertainment value to conspiracy theories, and now conspiracy theories are terrifying. Oh, my God, they're so much worse. <laughs> it's terrible like and you know like like and, and they were always terrible i look back at conspiracy theories from the 90s and it's just like oh wow like like so much of this is anti-globalist which turns into like oh you know it, and it's like protocols of the elders of zion and anti-semitic and it, 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 at its root <laughs> and it's like there's hundreds and centuries of this stuff but in the 90s everything seemed you know less harmful right oh my god take me back to the days when all i had to worry about was getting a colonoscopy from an alien <laughs> It's true. Jesus Christ. Um, it was a gentler time, um, sort of. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> I think that all this stuff has become a little bit harder, a little bit dodgier, a little bit more difficult to navigate. We think rightly, we try and figure out where this stuff came from and why. And often, even though it's entertaining, it has uh, sketchy origins. And we have to reckon with that. Uh, and that makes it a little bit less fun. But one of the things that I like about uh, Boardman's books is that he manages to bring all this stuff up and it is both fun and a learning experience. And But he's not heavy handed with it. It's there in the background. If you could look into it more on your uh, on your own, it, he, he's he's basically saying like, here, here's an avenue of research for you. And I got to tell you, man, one of the best parts about having the Internet with these books is that like he mentioned so much stuff like photos or accounts and and uh, of ghosts and UFO uh, encounters. And like I could immediately go on the Internet and like see the actual footage, which he sort of draws at his 
comic style. Uh, and it's so good. He's come back around and made these things great again. I love it. I hope it's a new golden age of monster and mystery books. Hell yeah, brother. Any uh, final thoughts on the mysteries of the world? I think that was it. More, more, more. Give me more. Please, publishers. <laughs> I'm here for it, man. You know, you yeah. know, uh, you know, I like a good weird. Uh, speaking of a good weird, speaking of publishers, Stu, we can finally pre order your book. We can. <laughs> Where would one go to do that? So if you look up my book on mitpress.com, there's a whole bunch of links. They're going to bring you to Amazon and Barnes and Noble and a whole bunch of other places. In July, you'll be able to order direct from MIT. But I would prefer that you buy them pre-order through Bookshop, especially if you're going to buy the deluxe edition because it's pricey. There's not that many of them. And I want them to get to you intact. Uh, I do not trust through personal experience uh, over the last two years. I, I feel like Amazon just doesn't ship things well. Books come to me from Amazon damaged, uh, literally in a box with no packing material, just rattling around um, as uh, somebody who like I don't mind if I buy an old thing and it's it's beat up. But like if I'm buying a new thing, I want it to look new. Bookshop does pack their books fantastically i have not had a problem with them they use book specific mailers uh and the other cool thing about bookshop is that you can uh associate your account with a local independent book seller and they get a cut of your your sales uh which no, i like I a it. lot yeah no it's great i have it connected to source of knowledge in newark and uh like i'll buy like a 16 dollar book and they'll get like five bucks or six bucks out of it like it, it's it's a pretty good scheme i i love bookstores you know i I think that the big box stores are, are fine but like i like mom and pop shops and we don't have enough of them around here uh so i want to try and support the ones that we do have and bookshop is a pretty good way of maintaining some of the convenience of amazon they're fast shipping it's not it's not as fast as amazon but at least the books get to you intact man amazon's important. not as fast as amazon anymore no it's really got downhill furthermore you know what you can't get on the internet that fucking sweet bookstore smell bro when you open the door <laughs> and the smell of old books hits you in just the right way mm, delicious so this was another amazing episode of the vintage rpg podcast do where can the people find you on the internet they can find me on Instagram at Vintage RPG. You could bet your bottom dollar that I'm going to be posted about these books next year. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I work oh, ahead. I'm sorry. It's it's always great because like someone new to the podcast is like, oh wow, next year. But it's like, no, no, no. You are in the right spot. It's 2024. We're posting about it now. <laughs> Oh, oh, very cool. Uh, you can find me across the internet at John McGuire RPG. Um, if you want to actually see what I'm doing, go to Instagram because that's actually where I actually post. But I'm on the Twitter, I'm on the Instagram, I'm on the TikTok as John McGuire RPG. You know, it's cool. Uh, if you like the show, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Your reviews really do help other listeners to find us. Well, I'm a terrible influencer. I, I accept this. Uh, if you really like the show, why not become a patron? Patreon.com slash Vintage RPG. It's cool because we have a behind-the-scenes look at Stu's book, Monsters, Aliens, and Holes in the Ground, and the other things that Stu's writing. We've got a behind-the-scenes look at 3 2 action and the stuff that I'm writing. Uh, we've got a killer Discord community that we'd love for you to be a part of. We have early release episodes. We're running games for our patrons uh, from a certain tier and higher. Stu's running West Marches. Uh, the game I'm running this month is going to be Alien RPG. I ran Cthulhu uh, last month, the month before I did DCC. Or did I do 5e? I did 5e. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I, we're uh -huh. running games. We're actually playing games. But yeah, we're, uh, we're running games. It's really cool. We love running games with you. So patreon.com slash vintage RPG. So for Stu Horvath, I'm John Hambone McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com 